Okay, we're going to get going on this. Uh, if you haven't noticed, the TV back here is not set up for this presentation. If you want to, come right on it, cozy up to us. We don't mind that. Uh, we did take our showers this morning, so we should be fairly pleasant smelling. So, but, uh, but please, uh, we're going to get going here. Door shut. All right. Wow, that was an exciting meeting there. So let's roll right into Manami Homes in Island Village. I uh, want to introduce myself. My name is Bennett Ruedis. I'm with Manami Homes. You've seen me before. I uh, think you saw me last time on, a, on January 31st uh, when we did our last community meeting. We did a town hall before that back in March of 2018. Uh, I've been interfacing a lot with uh, CROA, with the CDDs, both CDDs, uh, with this ad hoc group uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, that we formed to help um, handle the issues or the co communications with Manami Homes. And uh, so hopefully I'm a familiar face to you. Uh, I want to start with the end, of course. We want to try to get out of here by 7.45. We understand that, uh, I, I understand that uh, this is also dinner time for a lot of folks, uh, people with kids. So we're going to try to be as quick as possible. We're not going to talk very fast. Uh, we'll try to cover as much information as we can. Uh, Q&A at the end. So please, questions at the end. Uh, just like in the f uh, first presentation, we might cover that question throughout our, uh, our conversation, our presentation. Uh, but if you do have questions, we'll have it at the end. We do have a mic for that uh, as well. Uh, so. Quick introduction, so next slide please. Uh, I don't have the clicker, I'm already hands full. So uh, please, uh, uh, the, uh, I, said, I already said my name. Uh, I want to give you a quick update. Uh, change is inevitable in, uh, in, in life, in our business, and whatnot. Uh, Jeremy, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Redcard, <laughs> uh, that, that just, just spoke up here, uh, had mentioned uh, Keith Trace and uh, the community called Tohoka. Tohoka is a community in which Manami is also involved. Keith Trace is a St. Cloud uh, City Commissioner. Keith Trace used to work with Manami Homes. He had chosen a different path. And today, I'd like to introduce to you uh, my new boss, our new uh, Vice President of Land Acquisitions and Development, uh, someone who you may know already as a resident of uh, Celebration, uh, David Hume. David, if you have a uh, few moments, a uh, few words that you can share with us. I'll be quick. Thanks, Bennett. Uh, hello, everybody. Again, my name is David Hume, and I live at, well, I think I'm in a Crow meeting. I live at 1109 Rush Court. But um, I've been a resident with Celebration since 2008. And um, prior to this, I uh, have some home building experience and also spent five and a half years with the Walt Disney Company and the Celebration Company. So I come with a little bit of knowledge about the town and the development and all of the, um, uh, the issues and the opportunities that come with it. I'm really excited about the opportunity. Uh, I have two weeks under my belt, so I'm sorry I don't have a lot of things to tell you today, but as time goes on, I'm sure I will. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm really excited to be on the Madame team. I'm really excited about what we're doing uh, for this town and as we develop as a partnership, the Island Village Project. Um, and after we're done with this, if you want to uh, say hi or have any questions for me, I will certainly entertain them. But thanks for being here. Thank you, sir. Excellent. So also to my right, for, uh, as we continue our introductions, we have uh, two of our bright engineers with uh, Atkins, Atkins Global. Um, and they have been working with us uh, on this project since we started it, uh, since Manami has started it. In fact, they have been on this piece of property uh, well before Mattamy as well, uh, working with uh, other developers uh, who have come and gone, um, um, y you know, looking at Island Village and all that. Uh, first, uh, you may recognize him from our last meeting, uh, is the engineer record for Atkins is uh, uh, Chris Thompson, at least uh, engineer record for the civil, civil side. And then also uh, accompanying him is our traffic, our transportation traffic engineer, uh, Chris Russo. So two Chris's for the price of one. And Chris Russo <laughs> will be doing the bulk of the presentation uh, as it relates to traffic. Uh, so 
as I said at the beginning, this is an Island Village update and a, uh, a presentation on, on traffic and its impacts uh, that are generated uh, by Island Village. Okay? Let's see. So first, I'm going to go through uh, the quick update, and then we're going to get into Chris. Hopefully, it's relatively quick here. Uh, so, um, Chris, if you could go ahead and uh, flip to, uh, to to these first pictures here. Uh, you saw some of the outline there. I'm going to talk about Boulevard extension. I'm going to talk about the first phase, which is where all the homes are going to be, uh, uh, where we're building the homes. And then, of course, I'm going to talk about uh, the backdoor connection, which I'm sure uh, is somewhat related to what we just talked about here, somewhat, uh, but definitely related to what uh, Chris Russo, our traffic engineer, will talk about uh, during his part of the presentation. Uh, as it relates to the roadway, uh, we've started construction, obviously, uh, back in January of this year. We've been plugging away, banging away. Uh, we're into April, May, we're May now. So we're four months into a 15 or 16 month schedule. Uh, that is set to hopefully open the road uh, before the summer of 2020, okay? As it relates to the bridge, uh, the bridge deck, there's two components of the bridge, the bridge deck and the bridge truss. The bridge deck is also underway as far as construction is concerned. Uh, we've been pile driving and we've been uh, starting to get ready to lay out our first beams out on the bridge. If you haven't heard the piles, that's great because you, you're, you're far away or whatever. The, mo the people most interested or most affected by our activity, either with the noise or with the construction, are going to be Salvation High School, as well as the Emerson Apartments are across the street from Salvation High School. Uh, we talk with them, we coordinate with them uh, regularly, uh, and from uh, even as late as last week, uh, we've heard from the Emerson Apartment folks and so far, nothing, not a whole lot of complaints at all uh, that I can report to you. Uh, so if there's no reports from them, hopefully there's really no reports coming out of or complaints or whatever on our impacts of construction to, to Main Village or North Village or, or whatever other village uh, back here. Um, there should be no impacts here uh, unless you're dropping off kids at the high school or visiting uh, friends over there at the apartment. Uh, Okay, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. I'll get that in a minute. I understand. understand. So I also understand that some of you may have not seen our presentations before. Uh, so I would encourage you to take a look at the March 2018 as well as the January, January 31st, 2019 presentation that's out there on YouTube. Uh, uh, Crow was kind enough to go ahead and record it and post it up on YouTube. Uh, they're doing that tonight as well. I do not believe they are live streaming, uh, however, tonight. But these presentations that we do, we don't mind that it's being recorded. You're recording it somewhere probably on your phone anyway. So, so might as well get it somewhat you know, professionally recorded or whatever, put it up on YouTube, everybody can consume it. We're not, we're not, we're not afraid of that. Uh, as it relates to the, the bridge again, the truss, uh, there's a truss component that goes to the bridge. Um, uh, we're going through design and approval processes right now, so it's not yet being constructed, but it should be constructed in time uh, as well with uh, the finish of the entire project. So it should be online and, and, and working uh, before the summer of 2020. Okay? As it relates to coordination with a lot, we coordinate with a lot of people, a lot of people. You talk about alphabet soup, we go beyond alphabet soup. We're dealing with uh, the celebration company or, or, or in our vernacular TCC. We deal with uh, obviously uh, the CDDs, both CDDs, uh, the ECDD, CCDD, CROA. We're not necessarily dealing with Kanoa or CJC right now, but we're also dealing with Osceola County, uh, RC, Lady Creek Improvement District, South Florida Water Management District, for the Department of Environmental Protection, for the Department of Transportation. We're, deal, we're dealing with a lot of folks in, uh, in this expanded community that we're dealing with uh, in order to help bring uh, Island Village uh, to life here. Um, so I wanted to go through some of the visuals that we have here on, um, okay, can you flip, flip? Okay, so, so real quick, if you can't see, I, I, I already invited you to come up. So uh, this is a, a perspective from the high school. Sort of, uh, you can see the football field. Uh, this, is, uh, this picture is a little bit uh, tighter 
from back in December. This is where we are about 30 days ago in uh, at the beginning of April as uh, the road is starting to come to be built, into, uh, built here. That's where it was before. Can you flip to the next? This one's a shot looking down towards uh, Tampa. Looking down towards Tampa, okay? And you can see that before, this is an easement. This is I-4 over here on the uh, right-hand side. Uh, this is an easement that existed there uh, for, uh, for Orlando Utilities uh, Commission. And no road yet, uh, four months later, uh, you can see some activity. It, this is actually a, a, a photo of the actual bridge construction. That crane is there for the bridge construction. And then the next slide. If you look real careful, you might be able to see the swan and dolphin over here uh, in the background. But this is looking back towards Orlando. This is I-4. You could see uh, the high school football field and the apartments in the background here. And, and you could see our action. This is before, this is today, or 30 days ago. Okay? Uh, I'm going to get to uh, a better map here um, as we get to the back door connection. But uh, uh, let me talk about the preliminary, or uh, the, uh, the site itself. Phase one is what we call it. This is where all the homes are going. This is where the apartment is going. This is where the uh, elementary school is going as well. Okay? You see this. You, have seen, you may have seen this before uh, at the uh, January 31st presentation. Again, it's available uh, out there uh, on YouTube. I believe uh, either Crowa or I'm not sure if Manny's website is set up. The presentation for this, the slides, is, is available as well out there. Um, and, and if it's not, let, let us know. We'll try to make it a little bit more readily available or whatever. But part of that presentation was our site plan for phase one, about 600 total units, 300 of it being apartments, 300 of it, well in this, in this case here, about 276, call it 300, so 300 of it being single family homes, including um, uh, townhomes, as well as uh, single family, you know, normal, traditional single family homes, and a new product uh, that we're calling the motor courts, a four pack of, uh, of, uh, of homes with a shared driveway, We'll see how it goes and how, how that works out. Again, more details about that later. That's a different presentation or a side conversation uh, for us. Our, the purpose why I'm bringing it up is to tell you where we are with it. Um, back, the, the reason why we had the January 31st meeting was to inform, of course, from, let you guys know where we are with everything, but also it was a precursor to the public hearing approvals with Osceola County. Uh, we went through all of that and on February 11th, we had our Board of County Commissioner meeting, uh, and they voted to approve uh, the preliminary site plan, which is, which is this. Now, we have been working uh, with our consultants, like Atkins, uh, Mac Design Studios, they're sitting in the back right over there, um, to develop uh, the construction documents, the actual engineering plans, so that we can communicate that plan over to a contractor so that they can build the site. Not the homes, the site. Am I losing it? Okay. So that's where we are in the process. As it relates to the homes itself, uh, we are working with uh, several architects uh, to develop those plans. And no, they're not yet readily, uh, not yet available uh, to, uh, to the public at this point. Uh, we do have to uh, work on it in-house and we'll make sure the plan is working, uh, check with uh, the celebration company. Uh, for, you know, get those plans in front of them so that they can examine them, review them, uh, make comments, uh, and, and basically allow us to move forward with it. And as we get through that process, then, then our marketing and that, inf that type of information will start to come out on the homes themselves. Uh, so let's see, was there another slide behind this? I don't think so. Okay, so, so I want to get into the back door uh, as well and kind of talk about that. We talked about it last time on uh, January 11th, but this is the map that I wish I had put out in front uh, for this young lady over here. Can you flip to the next? So, Celebration High School, everybody knows who that is. Presumably, you know, it's Celebration High School. Across the street from Celebration High School is Emerson Apartments. We're building about one mile of road. We call it, we're calling it the front door, okay? We're building about one mile of road, which includes that bridge somewhere in the middle here, right about in here, up to, up to about this point here, 
Okay, that's what's under construction right now. Okay, this colored version here, thing here is uh, phase one. That's what's under design right now, going through the approval process with uh, Osceola County and, and all the other government agencies. All these blanks here are phases two through four, which are, we're not yet there as far as a, a detailed design like we have here. We've got probably a few, a few years of uh, inventory here to go through here, but we won't be too far, once we get these approved, we won't be too far from starting the program and, uh, and start laying out lot lines or whatever for phase two, three, and four uh, in probably the next six to nine months or so, maybe sooner than that. But phase one, this code is going through the, uh, the approvals right now. As it relates to the, what, the, what, I'm, what are you talking about, Brenda? What's the back door? The back door, if you could follow the, uh, hang on, Chris, if you could follow the red line, the back door ultimately, the, the road ultimately snakes through all of Island Village. And go ahead now, flip. And if you could imagine, this, the, uh, you can see the green area here is, is phases one through four. And you might be able to see this, uh, this blue colored, that is a right away that is on paper with uh, the Osceola, with Osceola County at the uh, property appraiser site. That's the back door. When you come up and look at this closer, there's a lot of lot lines in here as well. Um, Madman has no property interest in that uh, at this point. And in, 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 in several of our previous conversations, either through a community meeting or, uh, or even our last community meeting, but uh, a community meeting that involved the Osceola County, that was a point of contention with everybody. And I just want to make sure we get that out in front right now. Manami doesn't own any property, we don't own any property out to this. This is a connection that had been conceived back in 2016 via a comp plan, a comp plan amendment prior to Manami's uh, real estate interest in Island, Island Village. So that was cooking or cooked by the time Manami got, got here. We were aware of it, but ultimately someone is going to do that and hopefully, likely, not Madame Homes because we don't own the property. We don't own the right away. Um, when you go, if you go to the property appraiser's website and take a look at these lot lines, you'll also see it maybe on top of an aerial. There's not an actual road out there that follows what might be that, that right away. There's not a road that actually connects. There may be some dirt roads or service roads that some of these property owners or you know, Duke Energy is down here, one of the gas companies is down here. These property owners might have an easement. There's a big easement that cuts through here, but that doesn't mean the road is going there. The, the, that, that, is a, that, is, that is a big, hairy mess of, uh, of stuff in order for that connection to, to occur. Can it occur? Yes. Will it occur? Probably. Probably by the time Manning is uh, no longer selling homes in phases one through four. Okay? Um, Chris, can you go back one slide? Oh, wait a second. Can you go... Yeah, back. That's a good slide. As it relates to phase one, I let me back up a little bit. You may have heard terms go around called the side door. Not the back door, not the front door, the side door. Okay? Obviously the front door, which just, you know, that's the, that's the one way in and out of Island Village. The back door, it's kind of gonna build that eventually. The side door is a temporary access that I want you guys to make sure you understand. It's a temporary access in order for us to, uh, that allows us to come off of State Road 429 and I-4, okay? So we would have construction vehicles come off of 429 and I-4 and then hang a right there to get into the property while the bridge is still under construction. So obviously, this is our one way in and out of Island Village. Well, it's not yet there for even uh, our construction for uh, phase one. So we are working with folks like the DOT, Osceola County, uh, RCID, in order to secure that access here. Uh, it's part of what we're trying to get done here so that not only can Manami Homes start getting in here and doing some work, but once we do our work, so can 
uh, the school district of Osceola County, as well as potentially the apartment developer, as well as, of course, Madam Homes would want to get into there as well. Okay? Let's see. Can you go ahead and flip two slides? That might be the end of my part of the presentation. So I'm going to hand it over to Chris Russo to talk about uh, the traffic impacts as it relates to Island Village. And I think what we're going to do here, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, uh, is that he's going to go through the presentation. I'm going to moderate a little bit. Uh, this is really techie, techie stuff here. So if he gets too techy, I'm going to try to pull him up and, and see if we can bring some air, uh, you know, and all that. Very smart guy. He knows his stuff. Um, and, and he'll introduce himself a little bit more in detail. Um, I, I'm going to have to keep this if I want to. Is that hot? Right. Test, test. Thank you. Yeah. So. Thank you. Is it cutting in and out, or is it clear? All right. Right up on the chin, please. As Bennett said, it's kind of techy. I get kind of nerdy with this traffic conversation stuff, so bear with me here. What we want to do here today, though, is we would like to um, go through the next slide, please, Chris. The um, outline of the traffic analysis process, traffic engineering process, and how it relates to the project here that we're discussing today. Um, it can get a little techy and a lot of numbers involved, but I want to be a resource to explain the findings of a traffic impact study that was submitted as part of the um, site development plan to the county in August of 2018. So I want to explain those key findings and then have a d quick discussion on what do those findings mean? Because to a lot of people, are, they're just numbers. I want to make sure I'm portraying that information and explaining the information to everyone here and discussing uh, from our perspective how it relates to the traffic forecast and what we may see here today. Then at the end, hopefully be able to answer any questions that the presentation um, generates or any that you may have already. So a little bit about myself. I know I haven't met you guys before. Um, it's a community meeting. Why not show my small community of three? Um, my full name, Christopher Russo, Central Florida native. Um, I received my degrees here locally in town, University of Central Florida. Go Knights to any Knights in the room. Um, professional engineer in Florida and a professional traffic operations engineer, which is a nationally recognized certification board. And um, 12 years in the industry, 10 of which with Atkins is the engineer of record, as we discussed. Our quick task here today, five parts. We're going to review the local traffic impact analysis guidelines. This is what's been adopted by Osceola County so, um, for developments such as the one we're talking about. Um, the process of how we go through those guidelines, which would be collecting traffic data, um, looking at previous studies, task three, getting into developing a design traffic. That's another way of saying what traffic will forecast for the future and then use for analysis because uh, we don't want to use what's currently out there. We want to look into the future. Um, then w once we have that traffic, task four is to analyze the capabilities of the intersections and segments um, within Celebration Island Village as well as some of the surrounding network and then present those conclusions and recommended improvements as a follow-up. So jumping right into the local impact analysis guidelines, and we'll follow this process as a locally adopted methodology for traffic analysis, w also in the Osceola County, but as well around the state. Uh, Florida Department of Transportation does have traffic level service handbooks, site impact handbooks, which were followed as part of this analysis. Collecting the existing data counts, we did have a count program. Uh, we collected turning movement counts. And I, as Bennett showed, um, the high school, I want to always go back to the high school because that's an easy reference point for the project. We did collect data at that end of that road, at where the stars are, at the Celebration High School entrance, as well as Rural Drive and Celebration. We did that during the peak periods, the peak worst of the day, and we also counted 72 hours worth of data to s make sure that we captured the peak and to see any fluctuations that go up and down throughout the, throughout the week. Real quick, Chris, what time of year did you do that count? Was it during school? October 2017? Yeah. Thank you. To supplement the data, we've also referenced the um, a regional planning model, which was developed by another c consultant called named HDR, and that was done in 2017 as well. We'll get into that model a little bit into the presentation. So the bulk of this presentation, bear with me for this, is developing our traffic. I want to be as transparent here in how we provide this or go through this process. 
Um, what we do is we take those counts that we talked about. Now that's 2017 data. That's already historical. Even if I count it today, that's already in the past. We need to take that traffic and grow it to a, a common year so that we can analyze everything on the same level. That model was done in 2035. The goal, correct me if I'm wrong, Bennett, that the homes will all be built by 2035? We hope so. Yes. <laughs> so, the the, so the development traffic will be in place. So we'll be using 2035 as our model year. To get there, we have to estimate a growth rate. Um, we reference the same Bureau of Economic Business Research that the previous presentation mentioned um, with a 2% annual growth rate which it may be a little bit different from what was presented as in the last presentation. The um, reason being here is that we are using a essentially new facility, more of a constrained area that doesn't have the potential growth that some other areas of Osceola County provide. Um, the growth rates are done on a county basis, and this is more of a local project, not with a huge developable land area such as other places in the county. You do 2% for 18 years, that's 30% increase in those counts at Rural Drive and um, the high school. Now these are an estimate following the methodology, standard methodology for these types of projects. From there we have a two conditions. What if you built nothing? You just have that growth rate for the next 18 years. Celebration I or Island Village doesn't exist, you're still going to have traffic growth. What would that be? We'll use that as a baseline. And then we have the build condition, full build out of Island Village with the connection back door to County Road 532, which is where that would end and what Bennett showed on one of the previous slides. Uh, to illustrate some of the growth rates here, I did want to just quickly look at two maps. And I know it's tough to see, so for those in the back, I'll just explain it. These are, these are the, some of the turning movement counts as we collected in 2017 on your left. And on the right, just shows the 2% growth for 18 years. For one example, I just highlighted this just to show um, one movement can go from 772 to 1,050 within 18 years. And once again, I want to remind that that is a forecast of a projected growth. Nobody knows if that will happen, but it is the standard methodology used. Um, I might say a more conservative estimate given um, the developable land in this nearby surrounding area, but we to, the, to the process. The next step is we take that model I mentioned from HDR and we look at the difference between the development trips, were, which were explained in the middle picture, and the trips on the far right were as if you have that backdoor connection. It does show an additional 950 trips. The model shows that. The model is, is a forecast just like the growth rate of a of, of prediction. Um, we don't know if that's true. It's just part of the methodology used. What I want to talk about is that model, what it doesn't account for. It doesn't account for the proposed density of land use of Island Village curves or bends that you saw in the illustration from Bennett. There's this here from, in between my fingers there, from the Stair Road 532 to Phase 4 is a straight line as part of the model. We just saw in the pr previous slides it is not, it's very unlikely that it could be a st straight line given the number of properties in that area. The model assumes a straight line, path of least resistance there. Does not take into account intersection control, your stop signs, potential roundabouts, uh, pedestrians crossing the road at a mid-block crossing. And it also doesn't take into account your traffic calming, maybe your lane, your lane list, your bikes on the road, just additional friction that may be caused by an actual community. But the model is kind of, I hate to use the word dumb, but, but it, it's a computer. It can only use what you draw in. So it's, what I'm getting at, it's, I do believe that the back door is overestimating because it is a simplistic model. It is not an advanced um, judgment of what traffic could be given the, the conditions. So now we have the, back the counts, we have a model projection, and now we want to look at what the development may generate based on the number of, of units of homes, of any other type of um, development, retail, shops. So we reference what's called the ITE Trip Generation Manual. This is most widely used clearinghouse or transportation statistics in the United States. And what it's used for is it provides an objective chip generation measure for national averages. What that means is it takes the number of homes around the country and takes an average about how many trips are generated in day, AM peak, PM peak. It says if you have X amount of homes, you'll likely have Y amount of trips. Um, it's a national average and it is most recognized literature for this 
type of development and the county adopted methodology for um, generating trips. I provided a couple examples of how prescribed the methodology is. Once again, tough to see from the back of the room. This horizontal axis, you, you t t simply look at the number of homes. For this example, we use 872 single family homes. You go up to your line and provide you a range between 812 and 863 trips. So that's roughly you know, one, one trip per peak hour or so. Um, so we did this for all the land uses there. Uh, what we may see is single family homes, multifamily homes, an estimate of a size of an elementary school, and some town center amenities. And there's a uh, number of external trips based on the size and the units of these land uses. Um, some adjustments for internal capture because some people will be driving from their home to the school and back home or home to civic set amenities and back home. And you end up with your AMP hour generating about 1,161 trips. So, I know, bear with me, guys. Uh, so what we do is, if you look at the top, we take your 2035 with just the growth rate, you add the development trips to that, and you come up with the, the volumes that we're going to be using for analysis. So we're just growing, adding all the pieces together, creating that puzzle of, um, of, our, of our traffic so that we ensure that we're looking at the worst case traffic scenario to provide all the different um, alternative results. I'm not even using those. So now we have our traffic. Now we get into the fun part, the analysis, the simulation. And we're going to look at the, both segmentations and the intersections there. So we're going to start with segments. If you look at this graphic, celebration highs listed here at the end of this curve, the apartments there, road drive stubbing up off the right side. This dash lines the proposed, it will now in the middle being built um, extension celebration. And we broke this into segments because each segment has a different projected volume. Um, and we compared what the potential traffic may be against the Osceola County's um, adopted peak hour service volume. That's a fancier word for saying what's a comfortable capacity. This is not the most cars that could physically push through a road. It is what's more, what's comfortably your capacity. What, um, so you can get home and do your home and work more comfortably. And we compare that to a couple different alternatives. The first being, what if Island Village produ produced zero trips? 2035, 2% 2 growth, 2,000 is less than 3,000, 1,600 is less than 3,000. Um, so that volume to capacity ratio, essentially how full is your cup of 66% full, 52% full. So we did the same math with what happens when Island Village comes on. And we're showing additional trips in the peak and um, with the backdoor connection, so that additional model growth. So not just the trips from Island Village, but the model is saying is going to cut through. Um, once again, I, I, I already said, I th the analysis doesn't show, I think it's over overestimated based on the assumptions built into the model. Going to be a very conservative estimate. We recognize that. Um, we also recognize that the 2% growth may be conservative and potentially double counting some of the growth from this development because we're adding the project trips as well. That does show volume to capacity, the cup is overflowing. Doesn't mean it's not usable, it just means it's beyond the comfortable level. So we looked at some sensitivity analysis. What is more of a reasonable idea to think about from that cut through? With all that friction, is cutting it half a, a valid estimate? How about the growth rate? Um, cutting that in half a little bit because we do believe we're in a constrained area surrounded by wetlands. Um, just simply cut those both in half to look at how that would work in that situation. It does bring your, it does show the peak volumes are lesser at your comfortable capacity given that sensitivity analysis. And then we get into intersections. This first one we're going to look at is celebration at World Drive. And once again, we look at if Island Village built nothing, if they built out, and if, they, and if the intersection had some improvements done to it. As part of the prescribed method for traffic analysis um, impacts, we, you, if something is showing something, and then I didn't get into what the grades are, but that's the level of service, um, but it's showing a deficiency that we identify solutions that would bring it into um, 
what do you call it? Within our threshold, sorry, thank you. So what we looked at is with the project trips and the cut through, you are seeing delays, these are in seconds, uh, at the at an intersection of five minutes or plus, but the overall intersection being just under that. Um, with some improvements being adding the northbound left from Celebration onto Royal Drive, there's already one there today, but adding a second, in addition to adding a southbound right, channelized, so meaning yielding to traffic rather than sitting at the, the signal, would bring that intersection down to actually less delay than it is even today. All right, so that was Royal Drive. Now let's look at Celebration High School. And we wanted to look at different intersection types. Right now, it's a three-lake intersection, which a lot of traffic just came on with Emerson Apartments in the last few years. Um, but with the extension celebration, it would be a full four-lake intersection. So we wanted to look at how it would operate in the future, well how it's operating today, the first row, how it's going to be operating in the future with a two-way stop control, stopping at the, how much coming out of the high school or coming out of the apartments. In the future, if you signalized it, and in the future, if it were a roundabout. Now, a caveat this, this is just the project trips and background trips only. No cut through volumes in this. This is simply for screening of intersection alternatives. And we see that the signalized intersection has about 32 seconds of delay and the roundabout about 18 seconds of delay, both well within the, the county's thresholds for comfortable capacity, the service volumes there. Now, when you add that backdoor traffic, it, it paints a little bit of a different picture. Once again, I th we talked about that backdoor traffic being likely overestimated. Um, you look at the roundabout versus the signal, roundabout top row, signal in the bottom row, still showing s delay savings of more than 50%. Uh, we wanted to provide an illustration of, of an exhibit of the roundabout that is being proposed at the site. Um, two lane roundabout with uh, one lane being on this stub and one approach lane coming out of the Emerson Apartments. So this is an illustration of what we are, it's not just proposed, um, it's just not yet built. So it will have been uh, provided as part of our roadway package plan for approvals uh, by a uh, two Osceola County uh, for the roadway and uh, we're looking at building this. As a, uh, as a just to let you know, we're not going to build it tomorrow. Right, while everybody's kids are trying to get to school, they're all stressed out about AP examinations, they're stressed out about final exam. No, 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 no. June 1st, or whenever school lets out, I believe it's uh, June 1st or so, is when we plan on attacking this, uh, this build. And furthermore, we plan to be out of there and completed with this build before August, yes, yeah, before August 1st, before school starts up. So just FYI. So you guys are paying for We're paying for everything. Okay. All right, I'll caveat, I'll caveat that out in a little bit. Again, we'll take more questions at the end. Please, please remember them. But uh, keep going, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. So we may ask why roundabout. We showed some of the travel time savings, but I also want to talk about some of the safety savings. Um, these are the stats right off Florida Department of Transportation's website for roundabouts. Um, fewer severe crashes and 90% fewer fatalities. 75% fewer injury crashes. Um, roundabouts are safer for beginner and elderly drivers. With the high school nearby, I think we can consider them beginner, beginner drivers. Um, we talked about the, some of the time savings, but the additional time savings not mentioned in the peak hour analysis is how much time can be saved in off-peak. When the school is not in session, do we need a signal stopping, stopping ad adding that additional delay? Or with a roundabout, if no one's coming out of the high school, it is Simply go around the roundabout and go on your way into, into your trip. And there's some also environmentally friendly um, addition benefits to a roundabout as well. So less cars um, queuing up and congesting the, the air. Chris, did you talk about pedestrian or bicycle safety? I did not, but it is one of the, one of the points. The third bullet point. 10 to 40 percent fewer pedestrian and bicycle crashes as well. Um, so th with the pedestrian activity near, near the school um, and potentially more pedestrian and bicycle activity down into Island Village, 
we're, we're seeing benefits in all areas, safety, operations, and environment with the roundabout. Um, just to illustrate, wh well, why is it safer, you may ask. This is looking at a four-way, four-leg traditional intersection with a roundabout intersection. Those dots are actually conflict points, meaning locations that you might be able to run into another vehicle or a person. So the roundabout showing 32 vehicle conflicts, 24 pedestrian conflicts with a vehicle. I'm sorry, right, intersection, thank you. I haven't had dinner yet either. <laughs> and the roundabout showing eight vehicle conflicts and eight pedestrian conflicts. So the opportunity for, for those near misses or worse are much less. That's the data. Once we get into task five, I want to talk about the conclusions and the recommended improvements here. So what's this all mean? These are nice graphs, nice numbers. Some of the graphs you couldn't even see from the back of the room. So let's talk about the implications. First, we'll talk about road drive traffic. The one thing with road drive traffic, we talked about some improvements, which is not going to show up in the analysis, is the existing counts included drop-offs at the high school from celebration. You drop off and return back home. That's a difficult um, data to measure with the data collection plan that was in place here. And so what we're saying is that that's representative of traffic that's living in either the apartments or current celebration properties. It's going to be a different mix of trip patterns for island village traffic. They won't be dropping off the high school. Percentage, as high of a percentage will likely not be dropping off the high school and then going straight back north. They may come back south to Island Village or accessing Royal Drive or I-4 through Royal Drive. So it's going to be a diff different pattern that's just tough to scale that based on the existing counts. So we, th we believe those counts are swaying traffic a little bit more towards the celebration than is, than is um, reasonable. When we get into celebration Island, or just call it Island Village traffic, Based on the trip generation alone, just the trips being generated by those, those homes, the um, other amenities, and the school, the two-lane Celebration Boulevard operates within threshold acceptable conditions. Even with an additional capacity of about 300 to 350 vehicles, and that's in combined both directions. The regional model that we looked at included 950 additional trips. 950 is larger than 350. Um, but we established that the model does not account for the friction caused by the same bullet point list that we talked about before, the curves, the intersection control, the density of land use. And we, I added here the sc school traffic congestion. Um, I don't know about anyone here, but I, I pr purposely try and avoid passing schools if I can. But that model assumes that they'll be going right in front of the school, p potentially two schools, elementary school and high school on that morning peak. Um, those are the types of friction that's not included in a model. So the model attractiveness is overestimated. So what's that mean? Um, there's no way to really implement the traffic calming into the traffic analysis process, the attractiveness of that facility based on that bulleted list. So since the modeling doesn't evaluate the calming, we revert to um, the less prescribed methods, meaning that engineering experience and judgment. Um, based on engineering judgment, I don't think it's reasonable that an additional 950 peak hour trips will be added from that back door, cut through, whatever we want to call it. That's almost as many trips as being generated by the entire property. We said 12, 13, 14, don't quote me a number of homes that's in there was generating about 1,100 trips. They're saying the back door would count for 950, almost doubling the amount of trips. That seems unreasonable given um, general makeup of transportation. Um, based on that overestimation and the model, in the model and some of the conservative growth rates being this constrained area surrounded by wetlands, uh, we believe the two-lane infrastructure proposed by the developer should be sufficient. At this point, we would like to add, open up for questions, or would you like to add anything, Bennett? Uh, yes, I think uh, so. So, thank you very much for uh, your presentation there, uh, Chris. Uh, now, of course, uh, you know it's uh, it's 7:50. I, I said we'd like to be out of here by 
745. However, uh, we will be here to take uh, live questions now. Uh, please come up to the mic uh, to, 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 to give us the, the questions and all that so that everyone else in the audience can benefit from uh, hearing what that question is. Uh, and then also, uh, we will be available after the meeting uh, to talk individually or whatever uh, with, with, with you guys, as, as hopefully not as long as it takes, uh, but uh, we will be here as long as it takes. Understand that uh, you want to go to dinner and so do we, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tough it out as long as you guys will tough it out. So, uh, do we have any questions? If so, please come up to, we have a mic, a hot mic over here to the left. If you could come up to the, uh, the, the mic, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, whether it's about traffic or whether it's about Island Village in general, uh, we're, we're happy to entertain. Seeing no questions, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're just trying to have fun with me, aren't you? <laughs> no, please come to the mic. Uh, you, but please, uh, just like uh, in, uh, in, in choral fashion, uh, name, address. Sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Kate Newman Zohir. Um, we own a home in East Village, but we're living in um, Carlisle South. Um, so my question is, given the friction that we've had in this part of celebration, about what happens when some people think that the roads need to be bigger and um, we've designed a community that is not accommodating of that. Will the right of way that you guys are building allow for that two lane highway to get bigger? And uh, if either way, what it, does that seem smart or not smart to you guys? Are you trying to constrain it or are you uh, trying to leave room for expansion? I think I could take that question uh, from Chris Russo. Thompson might be able to chime in as well if you'd like to. I could take that, certain, uh, that question, certainly. So right now, our boulevard, if you could flip to that slide of the overall, the boulevard is being constructed as a two-lane road, one in, one out, okay, with, if you want to call it bike lanes or a paved shoulder, right? Uh, so 30-foot wide clear you know, to help uh, also with the, the, the Osceola County Fire desires of having a road that wide. However, it's still striped only as for two, uh, one lane in, one lane out. Beyond the curb of that road will be CCDD property. Can county condemn that? They could. Or any domain, they could, I suppose, if, they, if there's uh, a real push for that or, or whatever. So is it, is it never? I never say never, even though I just did. Okay. Uh, do we want a two-lane versus a four-lane. Does Manamy want a two-lane versus a four-lane? Uh, from the beginning, we've been saying that a four-lane facility is similar, maybe not exactly, but it's similar to Salvation Boulevard, what's out here now, which is not what Salvation Avenue is, which is where we envision the section of road going through a residential, pedestrian, bike-friendly town or part of a town. Right, we, 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 we want to be part of your town, right? So we want the boulevard, because it's still called the boulevard, we want the road going through Island Village to be pedestrian friendly, and a four-lane road is not conducive to that idea. So now, as far as our plans are concerned, we're moving right up, uh, well, it'll be property line right up to the CCDD property. So the, you know, if, if there is a take or a eminent domain, It'll be very, very difficult. I'm pretty sure not only island villagers, but also celebration folks would probably be engaged in that conversation. Engagement is good, right? I, and you know, you, 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 with uh, Commissioner Chowdhury and staff, thank you for you know for her wisdom to come out here to to not only present one side. She wasn't presenting one side, or she was presenting alternative ways of, uh, you know, in, our, in that presentation before with Oswego County. So thank you for that, uh, Commissioner. But yeah, uh, for <laughs> what's beautiful about this town, from my experience, and I'm, I hate to admit it, but I'm from the outside. I do not live in, uh, in celebration, right? Having said that, I, I do offer you new perspectives, a little bit more objective. I'm not so... Uh, uh, wound up emotionally <laughs> about why it's taken so long to drop off my kid at high school uh, and all that. Uh, like Chris Russo, who's 
a third party is looking at this objectively with his professional background, we're looking at this to, to, to make good decisions and not necessarily get wrapped up with, uh, with all the emotion, or even call it the politics that are involved with the community as far as why this versus that and, and, and all that. So, wow, just one question today. Oh, come on, please line up, please line up. Because it kind of gives us an idea how, how much time we've got here. Please line up. Yes, sir. Uh, Stan Kroc, 416 Campus. Just curious if there's any reason to discuss other retail development at World Drive and Celebration Boulevard and its potential impact. Because it would seem strange to me if we put, you know, another small mall on the west side there, that that wouldn't impact traffic. That is an excellent question. Uh, we have heard uh, through the news, uh, through the news media, uh, that uh, uh, one of our big, uh, one of our big uh, developers here in town, Unicorp, is looking at a piece of property here. Um, at the site, uh, they cited in the article at the intersection of World Drive and, and I-4. I don't know which intersection that is. Uh, they are talking with the Celebration Company. I'm sure Celebration Company owns property all around, all, all four of those uh, points, corners of World Drive and I-4. Um, Chris, can you talk? anything uh, or, or how the model may have used uh, future development on uh, Celebration Boulevard and how it might impact, how it might do something to our, our model as we looked at it for Island Village and the back door. Okay. So the, the model that was referenced earlier in the presentation does take into account future land uses that are in place that are may um, not be there currently. So we're taking that into account and then assume a how attractive or the, the gravity of that area for more for more vehicles and traffic. So it does take that into account, but it's looking at it from a land use perspective, not from necessarily a implemented or approved project. The model doesn't know what's, it can put approved in, but when we're looking to 2035, there can be a, a variety of of development, so it looks at the land use. So is it co commercial? Is it farm uh, agric agricultural in the current comprehensive plan? So it does take that into account, but it, it would not know about this particular developer and what their plans are. Great, thank you. So you had a question? Hi, Roger Ducanoy, I live in East Village. Um, my question really is, what did you consider for the parking lot that call I-4, you know, in terms of the, you know, the second exit to the thing? I mean, if it goes through and I-4 isn't improved and, you know, there must be plans in place, how, how is that going to impact? Today, if you open that up, you'd have 100 cars, 200 cars an, an hour, 300 cars an hour, something crazy during rush hour because it's a parking lot on I-4. Okay, great, thank you. So, Chris, there's lots of caveats there, I'm sure. So, I think that's more your realm there to answer that one. Thank you for the question. There, there is, there are studies right now in place um, for adding the express lanes to be in this area on I-4 and all the way to Polk County line, which would be the extent of the district. If if approved and built, that would be an additional four lanes of capacity on I-4 in this area. Um, the reference to the parking lot along I-4, that's, that's tough to tell. I, I don't know if it would be any better navigating through the second additional five miles of, of two-lane roadway with pedestrians crossing the road, with school traffic, with stop signs, with those hard, cur hard turns that were shown in the existing or available um, property lines. It, 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 it's a good question, but I'm not sure there is a good answer to it. I'm going to just stop you here. All of Chris. Is there any change in 14 in the 429 interchange? And that is somehow close to our new development? So I'll help you out to repeat for everybody in the audience as well. So folks who may be watching this at home later, uh, not live. Uh, the question was about uh, Street Road 429 uh, and how it might connect with I-4 and how does that come into play here. 
uh, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, he's also referring to what's called the Point Serena Parkway e extension. I, don't, I, I think it, it, it's related to Point Serena Parkway, but uh, yes. Uh, can you talk about that as well? Ben, unfortunately, I do not have any information on that interchange. We were, we were looking at the traffic within the development. Um, that, that I do know that information will be available if, if it's already been decided a lot on FDOT's website for uh, future projects. We were just looking at the, it's called Beyond the Ultimate. It are all the planned improvements in this, in this stretch of I-4. You can simply Google that Beyond the Ultimate FDOT and find a ton of information on what the plans are for I-4 in connections with 429. I, I did not prepare that information tonight. Uh, so, related to piggyback on his, uh, on his information that he just uh, uh, provided, for the Point Siena Parkway extension, uh, you may need to go to the Central Florida Expressway Authority's website to find out more information about that. Uh, about that. All of that is, uh, the Point Siena Parkway is still proposed from what I understand. Last uh, that I saw on their website, there was information that was maybe a year old, uh, 20 January, March 2018, last year. Uh, I haven't seen, we look, but we're not, you know, it's not necessarily high up on our radar. We're looking to see, to, uh, to be uh, educated ourselves as far as what's going on there, so that at least we could say, oh, we saw some of the information, please go to them as the experts of what's going on there. But such a Ford Expressway Authority had, uh, from what I could see, multiple alternatives to what the points are going to Parkway might look like. I don't know if any of it, I don't know where it is in process as far as right away acquisition or design or anything like that. So um, uh, the model from uh, my understanding of what Chris Russo had spoke about, uh, these are big, big roads, major roads, three lane, potentially two lane each direction, right? Uh, big divider, uh, divided high, uh, uh, medium, moving fast, limited access. Uh, if they want to get from Point Santa Parkway to Tampa, or really in our case, if they want to go from Point Santa Parkway to Orlando, that's probably the facility that they need to be using rather than going by two school sites, a roundabout, probably more roundabouts, probably more stop signs within Island Village uh, you know, we're going to be working with Osceola County as well for some of these traffic calming measures that we want to introduce into uh, the, 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 well, the boulevard network, or not, it's not even a network, it's a one road that's going in and out, right? The boulevard on how to add uh, um, friction to the system. Friction also means lower speeds. Friction also means safer for the pedestrian. Uh, you know, this is an elementary school, but we are uh, that we are working together with school district across the county uh, to build K through five, and uh, that it's not a this is not even Salvation Ave. I've seen it. We'll see it tonight. I'm sure. I mean, some folks speed right through right past uh, uh, town hall. We want it slower than that, right? And, and we we can't afford to to, to compromise really on not only safety, well, really safety on, on that issue as far as uh, how much traffic, how much speed is coming through Island Village from within or from the outside. We want to discourage as much traffic uh, as possible to, to promote really the pedestrian friend friendliness of the, pro uh, of, the, of the community. Anything else? Wow, just four, three or four questions there? Thank you very much. We'll be here mostly tonight until it's time to go home. Thank you.